me, the interest in modern slavery probably goes back as far as my parents' own migration from Spain. So we come from uh, the region of Valencia, and um, a, a beautiful little village surrounded by orange groves, um, which has very limited economic prospects. So harvest only happens for about four months of the year, and people generally tend to move around to look for work elsewhere. My parents were, in fact, part of the first wave of Spanish economic migrants that left the rural areas to earn their money abroad in the 1960s and 70s. And during this period, over 100,000 Spanish workers every year migrated to France, Switzerland, Germany, and the UK. And collectively, they were uh, an economic powerhouse. They uh, brought in foreign remittances that were equivalent to almost 30% of the country's trade deficit. They didn't actually get to the UK uh, until the 1980s, and they arrived with a couple of suitcases and four children in tow. And they faced many of the same challenges that migrant workers all over the world face today. Poor language skills, a lack of knowledge of the local culture. They didn't really know what to expect in terms of um, housing or work. And even if you ask them today, the food was a total mystery. So they became part of that workforce that you don't see. The people who clean our homes, the people who build our offices, the people who uh, pick and cut and pack our food and those that serve it. So what exactly does modern slavery mean? According to the new UK legislation, it's the offense of domestic servitude forced a compulsory labor and human trafficking for the purpose of exploitation. And why am I telling you the story about migrant workers? I'm telling you the story because migrant workers are the ones that are most vulnerable uh, to labor exploitation, simply because of poor language skills, a lack of knowledge of the rights, and how to enforce them. Migrant workers in a situation of modern slavery have their passage arranged for them. Uh, they may have their travel paid up front by acquaintances, and then they are put in touch with an employer who promise the world, they promise the world, but have rarely any intention of delivering. To give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem, the Home Office estimates that there are over 13,000 people in a situation of modern slavery in the UK alone. And whilst it may not be that companies are directly employing traffic people, there has been a rise in the number of contractors and subcontractors that are providing cheap labor into companies. So the moral to that story is, if a deal looks too good to be true, it probably is. To be clear, about 27% of potential victims of trafficking involve informal labor intermediaries and agencies. Trafficking and smuggling is today the second most important criminal industry in the world. It's actually worth over 150 billion US dollars. So it's it's very big. And I, I want to be absolutely clear. When I'm talking about modern slavery, I'm not talking about people who are unhappy with their contracts. I'm talking about people who can't walk away, who simply by coming to work may have backed themselves up into a corner and are forced to work 24-7, usually under threat or intimidation. So I've talked a little bit about what modern slavery looks like in Europe. But what does it mean for us uh, with our coffee supply chains? According to the Global Slavery Index, there are over 45.8 million people in a situation of slavery today. Now, that's roughly two-thirds of the UK population. And it sounds really impressive when you say it like that. But let me tell you, if we work together collectively, we can have a massive impact. So I've been working in the coffee industry for over 10 years, and I've run monitoring programs in 14 countries covering indigenous communities, plantations, and smallholder farmers. And 
there are some very simple steps that we can all start taking. Uh, Chad was talking earlier about what we can start to do to engage. Simple steps that we can all start taking to make sure that we're meeting legislation like this. So I'll give you a few examples and some ideas of how you can go about it. This is a picture of a family of six in Honduras. Now, they were recruited about a 10-hour distance from the farm, despite the fact that there was local labor available to pick the coffee. When they arrived there, they were told that they would be paid at the end of the harvest. And this was really to keep their money safe. However, they were also told that if they decided to leave before the end of the harvest, they would have to pay back the transport, the accommodation, and all the costs. So essentially, that would have meant that they earned no money. So the thing to point out here is that nobody retains another person's wages to keep their money safe. They do it to make sure that workers can't leave. It had a very simple solution. We just asked the farmer to make sure that workers were paid weekly and that he provide lockers so that they could keep their belongings safe. Moving on to Kenya, and on this side, we had workers that were, were living and working miles away from the nearest village. So they were being charged exorbitant amounts of money for food, housing, and tools. And at the time, in this community, HIV w w was a big problem. And so workers were keeping whatever bits of money they had to be able to buy medicine. But when we added up the cost of working and living on that farm, we found that they were just about earning 10% of the minimum wage. And they had several months worth of debt. The thing to point out here is that modern slavery actually uses a person's basic need for food, shelter, and safety and turns it into debt bondage. In this case scenario, Again, we took very simple steps. We asked the farmers to make sure that the food prices were brought down to the local market rate. We brought in an NGO to help with the provision of medicine. And then we asked that the cost of the housing be capped, almost provided as an in-kind benefit. Now, some of you may have come across a situation of modern slavery and not been able to identify the problem. Or you may have identified the problem, but you didn't know what to do about it. With the UK Modern Slavery Act, businesses finally have a legal mandate to act on it. At the moment in the UK, if you are a business with a turnover of over £36 million, you are being asked to publicly report on the issue. So a company can no longer say that it trusts its suppliers to act in line with the law. We are being asked to get out there and check our operations and our supply chains. And there are, again, some very simple steps that we can start uh, taking. The legislation asks us um, about transparency on a few of these issues. The first of these is our operations and supply chains. There is often, if not always, a problem with migrant workers who do not speak English, and agency workers as well, don't speak English, and can't communicate with management directly. And in the coffee supply chains, there is almost always some sort of issue when workers are brought in from an outside area to pick coffee. The legislation then asks us what policies we have in place to manage the modern slavery risks. So what does this mean? I don't believe in policies that you don't use, actually. I don't believe in a piece of paper. Essentially, what this means is that you need to have a policy that communicates your expectations to suppliers. You need to say what your approach is to modern slavery, and you need to say what you're going to do about it if you find it. So this is all about transparency and communicating your values. Now, I would like to add a word of warning here. There are some legal firms that I've come across that have been advising companies to take a really hard line and to uh, develop what's a zero-tolerance approach. However, I really think this could have the adverse effect of suppliers deliberately trying to hide the problem. So imagine a coffee farmer 
who's already stretched financially, being asked to implement a new set of rules and regulations without being given the extra resources to do so. So if you threaten their business, they will do everything in their power to not communicate any issues with you, and this potentially exposes us to risk. The legislation is then asking us to report on what due diligence systems we have in place. It goes without saying that any company employing should check their workers and the labor agencies that it uses. For coffee supply chains, compliance with the Act and uh, reducing risk actually means that you need to have traceability for all of the coffee purchases all the way down to the farm. And after my talk, uh, Kim UNESCO is going to give you a few tips on some due diligence questions that you can have. In my experience, companies who have strong relationships with their suppliers uh, usually know better than most what the risks are going to be. But essentially speaking, due diligence is about traceability, monitoring, and remediation. It's just part of responsible sourcing. This is an important point with spot coffee purchases. So if you're a coffee buyer and you need to get a hold of some coffee at the last moment, you need to make sure that the traders that you're working with are implementing the same policies and management systems that you have in place, because ultimately they're considered your suppliers. So bear in mind, nobody at this moment is asking us to solve modern slavery. We're just being asked what steps we're taking to make sure that it's not happening. This then takes us nicely to the fourth point in the legislation, which asks us to identify high-risk areas. So think about where you have the greatest exposure. So if you're buying coffee, think about those countries and those regions where there have been reports of forced labor or child labor. For the farms that are dependent on migrant labor, ask about where the workers are coming from. Are they using gang masters? Have a look also at uh, places where there is loose legislation or poor worker protection. And think about whether there are any complaints from local indigenous communities. These are just some of the questions that you need to take into consideration. Now, whilst a, a site visit of every supplier would be unbelievably costly, a desk review of NGO reports and human rights sites, uh, as well as just a simple Google search, could be a first step towards developing a longer-term risk assessment plan. So it will show you, that information will show you where you have the greatest exposure as a company. And also, at that point, you can start to think about what steps, what actions you're going to start to implement. And this takes us to the fifth point. We're being asked what steps we're taking to manage risks. Now, a lot of companies are talking about uh, monitoring programs, and then others are talking about their work with certification schemes as a way to describe the work that they're doing on, on modern slavery. Certification is a fantastic first step. We've seen cleaner water channels from the pulping stations. We've seen uh, improved housing, improved worker welfare, and even financial premiums as, as farmers have strived these last 15 years to meet international standards. However, certification is not a panacea for dealing with modern slavery. You need to conduct risk assessments and potentially develop producer support programs. So for me, managing risk means working with suppliers, local exporters, NGOs, to develop producer support projects. So if a risk assessment has found that uh, workers are not being paid on a regular basis, make sure that you make it a, a contractual arrangement when you buy the coffee that you expect workers to be paid weekly. If a risk assessment has found that workers are being employed over long distances, make sure that the terms and conditions of employment are communicated to those workers before they arrive on the farm. This takes us to training. We are being asked to report who we're training and on what. Now, companies 
tend to focus a lot of their training on coffee buyers and uh, the technical teams who often deal with suppliers. But we also need to look at training for the HR teams that are recruiting directly into our own companies. Whilst there might be labor-specific, coffee and regional-specific training that can be developed for our suppliers, there is no doubt that training in recruitment practices is going to be universally useful because this is where you might actually spot the problem. Going forward, we will be asked how effective we are at dealing with modern slavery. And in this respect, the legislation is asking us to develop key performance indicators. It's a very business-like approach. Overall, uh, for me, the true power of the Act lies in its call for transparency from companies and organizations worldwide, which will allow informed consumers and NGOs to monitor and track performance. And I'm sure you'd all agree that a negative NGO campaign could be much more damaging to brand reputation than any civil penalty ever could. It may also be that in five years' time, we take the same hard line that the United States did a few months ago when it went all out and uh, it actually introduced legislation to ban the import of goods derived from slavery. However challenging uh, this legal landscape may look, and however awkward this adaptation period, there is no doubt that the legislation is designed to create a race to the top. And rest assured, it's not just coffee that's uh, falling into the legislation, it's all industries and all sectors. I'm delighted to uh, be in a room where um, people's passion in life is high quality, but this should extend to the quality of life of everybody involved in producing our coffee. This is more than just uh, box ticking or a nice corporate social responsibility exercise. Companies are being asked to get out there and change the way that they do business. So we have the opportunity as an industry uh, to change hundreds of years of history. And whilst it's not going to happen overnight, it will happen. Overall, the power of the Modern Slavery Act and legislation like it is that it gives us the possibility to positively impact on the lives of thousands of vulnerable workers who harvest so much of the world's coffee. Thank you.